Well, we've been asking you to send in your questions on the migrant crisis for us to put to a panel of experts. With me now to uh, give you some answers are Stephen Booth, co-director of Open Europe. That's a think tank that campaigns for reform of the European Union. And joining us from Geneva, Melissa Fleming, the head of communications and spokeswoman for the UN's refugee agency, the UNHCR. Uh, thank you both very much for taking the time to talk to us. And we'll try to get through uh, as many questions as we can. Uh, Melissa, I'll begin with you, if I may. This question from uh, Louise, yeah. who's emailed us saying, why is this just a European problem? I don't see the United Nations stepping in, and they should be. Well, it is. It is not just a European problem. It's a universal problem. It's a problem that all countries in the world should be tackling. And, and the UN, UNHCR, has been shouting in the dark uh, for many years, uh, please support our organization and the countries that are hosting four million refugees in the neighboring countries to Syria. The support has not been coming in over the years, um, and this is a, partly a result of it. So it's become a, a European problem because the refugees have now started to come to Europe. But before that, it was a problem um, primarily for the countries neighboring Syria. Uh, perhaps, though, it's just coming to the attention then of, of people in the EU. That's what you're saying. Yeah, and, and, and that's Stephen? what I'm saying. Um, and, yeah. uh, Stephen, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think part of the response to the crisis that, that the EU has, uh, has undertaken has, has, has made it more of a European problem by focusing simply on kind of what's going on in, internally within the EU's borders about relocating migrants uh, and not only not addressing the root causes of the crisis. Um, only today are EU leaders actually sitting around the table and going, what, why is this happening? Why are we seeing a spike in Syrian refugees? What's driving this? Um, and I think that has to be the focus. And as, and as the previous guest said, that's a global issue, not simply a European one. And um, the response should be global. Uh, but do you think that the UN is doing enough at this point because the question from Louise suggests that, uh, at least to her, she doesn't see the UN stepping into this. Well, I think what we've seen, I mean, the figures suggest that the UN missions are being underfunded and that uh, certain EU member states are taking, uh, playing a greater role. I mean, the UK actually is providing a lot of funding, whereas some other member states probably could provide a lot more, and that's one of the issues on the agenda um, this evening. Okay, well, uh, we'll come back to some of the themes um, raised in that question in another question a little bit later. But uh, let's move on to this, uh, this question via Twitter from Jean Lemon saying, what's to stop all family members from legally joining migrants who've been allowed in and overwhelming social services? Uh, Stephen, what do you know about this? Will uh, family members from migrants who are allowed hmm. legally to enter the European Union, will those family members be allowed to join them? Uh, as I understand it, different member states have slightly different rules to that. It's not harmonised across the European Union, so um, it depends on the member state. But I know in the UK that that is possible. Once you've been granted asylum, you are able to, um, your, your family members are also able to apply for asylum, and, and the UK would try to look favourably on that. Um, but I think the question also raises this bigger issue about what is a sustainable n number of people, and I think those are the kind of issues we need to be talking about. How do you manage the flow of people? And I think the problem at the moment is that there is... Um, there is sort of an, uh, an implicit assumption that once you reach the shores of Europe, um, either as an asylum seeker or as an economic migrant, you'll be able to stay. And I think that if, you, if, if, that, if that sort of impression is allowed to persist, um, we could create unsustainable levels of people that, that Europe really is not able to deal with. Uh, and Melissa, a lack of harmonisation, if you like, of, of rules and regulations, that's really been exposed as people uh, arrive on the EU shores and then try to move to their countries of choice. Absolutely. I mean, we've said these are numbers, um, actually, that we deal with on a regular basis in other parts of the, of the world. It's manageable when um, when there's a system in place. What this has exposed, as you said, is that uh, there is a European Union, but it is not united when it comes to uh, people on the move. And uh, this has showed that the, that the system is completely fragmented. And what's happening, our borders are coming up. The problem is being pushed from 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 one country to another. Um, and, you know, until there's a system in place that's united, the problem is we're just going to continue to have chaos. We do believe that this is a problem that can be resolved, can be managed. Um, a lot of the proposals being discussed today in Brussels would go a long way um, if they were implemented immediately uh, to uh, stabilizing the situation. Just briefly, do you think, though, that uh, family members should be allowed to join migrants who've legally been allowed into some of these uh, European countries? Well, again, these, what we're talking about 
here are recognized refugees, and this term terminology is important. Uh, as the previous speaker said, when refugees are re recognized, they've been screened, their asylum application has been approved, they can then apply to, uh, to bring family members. Generally, these are very close family members. For example, a husband bringing his wife, um, a, a mother bringing her two children. Uh, these are the kinds of uh, close family relationships we, uh, we believe uh, also are really important to support. We are for the legal burden sharing um, of refugees from the neighboring countries. We are for have, preventing people from having to take dangerous and irregular journeys to reach Europe. Why don't we go for more resettlement, more family reunification, um, so that it is, it is a much more manageable crisis, mm -hmm. that the, the countries in the region are not um, saddled with the entire burden, and uh, yeah, well, the, the things are under control. Let, let me come in there, Melissa, because I suppose some people are concerned that the, the screening process, if you like, to establish who are uh, genuine refugees, they're concerned about whether that is effective. Uh, Stephen, a question for you from uh, Joe via Twitter. Why don't uh, they claim asylum in Turkey or Serbia? I mean, that underlines a common question that I've seen coming in yeah. from viewers throughout the, the many weeks now of this crisis. They're wondering why, if people are coming into and arriving into a country that is a safe haven, um, why are they then saying, well, Germany is their preferred destination or Austria or, or, or Sweden and so on? Well, I think, again, there are lots of different factors at work here. I think, and again, there's, 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 there's different groups of people we're talking about here. And what this crisis has exposed is that um, the, UK, the EU system is not really fit for purpose. There's, there's, there's been a, um, a big problem with um, economic migrants trying to claim asylum in the EU and then not being returned, which then mean, again muddies the waters and it's harder to tell who's, who's an economic migrant and who's an asylum seeker. Um, but referring to the specific question, um, the fact is that lots of people have claimed asylum in these other countries and I think what the previous speaker is saying is that um, these, the, the breakdown of, of these countries and sort of struggling to cope with the vast numbers um, is causing the recent spike in numbers trying to reach to Europe. And again, I think Europe can do much more to help in that in terms of funding the camps in the neighbouring countries. And again, I think the UK has, has taken the lead there and other member states should probably follow suit. Um, Melissa, a question from Sergey via Twitter. Why don't EU countries take migrants directly from UN camps like the UK is doing? Would that be your preferred option? Would that be a more orderly way of doing things, of processing people? Yes, and there are a number of EU countries, including Germany. Um, Germany takes the most uh, th through this kind of channel. We call it resettlement. And that is when UNHCR identifies people who are particularly vulnerable, who are struggling in the neighboring countries, we match them with, uh, with countries. There are a large number of European uh, Union countries that um, help uh, share the burden this way. Um, what we ask for is a menu, really. Um, more resettlement uh, so people who really are in desperate need um, can get on an airplane after being screened and to come to, to countries um, and have a refugee status. Uh, the second is more money for organizations like ours so we can help the people. And I want to emphasize that there are still four million Syrian refugees in the neighboring countries and most of them just want to stay in the region. They want to go back home. They are not you know, desperate to come to Europe. They wouldn't be coming to Europe unless their situation wasn't so bad. And this is what we're dealing with. So we need more, more legal avenues, but more investment in the host countries, in organizations like ours. Of course, though, and I have to emphasize this, it is not a crime to seek asylum. The people coming um, are coming because they're absolutely desperate. They do not find that there is anywhere else to go. The people oh, well. I'm referring to are people from uh, Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan right now. These uh, people should, should be welcomed in Europe, and we need to find a managed solution. The numbers in the bit wide spectrum of things are not that big. Uh, well, we're getting a lot of um, tweets at the moment um, expressing concern that terrorists, extremists might be using this huge flow of people to get across borders. Uh, Isabella via email writes, how are EU nations protecting citizens from possible terrorists or extremists crossing borders every day? Uh, Stephen, is that a concern of yours at Open, uh, open Europe? 
Well, it's not something I'm an expert on, I'll be honest, but I think it's something that makes people, people are right to be concerned about, and I'm sure that has to be part of the screening process when you're looking at um, potential people, because in large numbers, uncontrolled, that has to be a concern. Um, and that's, again, it reveals part of the, the, the disunity within the European Union in the sense that Hungary moved to secure its border. Um, it was criticised in the first instance, but now that's seen as part of the solution. And clearly, if you're going to have a passport-free travel area inside the Schengen zone of the European Union, you have to have a, uh, a security and a secure external border um, and security is part of that. Uh, Melissa is that a concern of yours at the United Nations that that some extremists might be using this? Well first and foremost we're more concerned about the um, the uh, pe what people are fleeing from and people can't forget that the most people who are uh, most of the people who are fleeing from Syria are fleeing from terrorists. Um, they're fleeing from ISIS um, also, not to forget that there have been about 30,000 estimated uh, Europeans who've gone in the other direction to fight in Syria. So these are our concerns. Obviously, the world needs to be concerned about terrorists, but these are people on the run. Um, I don't think that, for the most part, their intention is to commit acts of terrorism. Their intention is to find a safe place to restart their lives. Um, Tim Hall via Twitter, uh, Stephen asks, has Angela Merkel's welcome to Syrian refugees worsened the migrant crisis? Do you think that has acted as a pull, Stephen? Uh, I think to some extent it, it probably has, um, and, but I think it, also, it, just, it highlights just how, how uncoordinated the response was, and I think that I think it was probably an irresponsible decision to make that unilateral decision. Um, and as I said, I think too much of the European response has been focused on Europe itself rather than the actual root causes and why people are coming and the longer term issues. Because unless you address those issues, um, you're going to see the, the kind of recriminations we've had now about just relocating 120,000 people, which is a very small number in the grand scheme. But, of but the crisis is almost a way ahead of the root causes, isn't it? Well, I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, unless you address the root causes and address why people are coming, the crisis in Europe is going to keep on coming back. Um, the 120,000 people is going to be a small number compared to the, the increasing number of people who may want to come if um, the breakdown in the camps and, and the issues driving people out of the lo local areas aren't resolved. And that's why I'm surprised it's taken so long for Europe to address that, that side of the equation yeah. rather, rather than its own. In, in your view, is this um, quota system that should be ratified today, um, is that already too little and too late? Because it's dealing with 120,000 refugees and we're looking at almost you know, half a million people coming into Europe so far this year. Yes, I think it was, it was a lot of misplacement activity, basically, because um, you've created huge political divisions within the European Union. Um, an enormous amount of political capital and time has been spent on um, this relocation thing for 120,000 people. Um, you've forced a vote on countries that weren't willing to take part. And none of this addresses the fundamental issues um, and the fundamental driving factors of why people are coming. And there are only going to be more people coming unless those factors are addressed. Um, Melissa, a question for you from Chris via Twitter. How many Syrian refugees will go home after hostilities in the war there end? I mean, that, that's a, a pretty difficult question to answer, isn't it? It's a difficult question, but we can look at, you know, historical uh, movements. And if you take, for example, the Bosnia War, um, it, 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 I think well over 60 percent went back home. Um, so people generally fleeing from war, um, want a place uh, to restart their lives for the time that the war continues to rage and until which time it is safe to go back. Um, these are people who involuntarily left. Um, you know, obviously some will, will feel that they can never go back. It really depends on the situation. But if Syria to, were to become, war were to end tomorrow and the conditions were there for people to go back and rebuild their homes, you would see a massive wave of people returning. Uh, and I guess it depends to a certain extent on how long people are then living for in the new country, how much they put down roots there, whether they go back to their original country or not. Absolutely. I mean, um, the average time a refugee unfortunately now spends in exile um, is over 15 years um, because the wars are just going on and on. Um, with no solution. We really hope this isn't the case with the Syria war. It's now in its fifth year. Um, the refugees in the neighboring countries are, are languishing. Um, they're, getting, they're getting very uh, concerned and impatient. I can tell you that 99% of them were intending to go back home. Now they're losing hope. 
um, and they're living in much worse conditions than before. They've been thrust into, you know, abject poverty and putting their kids in, in instead of in school, you know, to work in, in fields for four dollars a day. This is not a life that, that they're going to, to, to tolerate for very much longer. No one, none of us would. So unless there's another alternative, uh, we may continue to see more movement from those countries into Europe. Uh, Stephen, I don't know if this is an area that Open Europe has done any work around in terms of looking at how long people might stay in host countries or, or whether they would actually return. No, it's not something we've done lots of work on, but I think um, the point being again with this, I think if, if, the, if the focus is actually on the countries in the region, the neighbouring countries, um, I think we also need to think about rebuilding Syria if there is a, an end to this. Um, and the people that are most likely to stay in the region are probably the people most likely to go back. So again, I think there is actually a responsibility there for if you want to be looked at long term and rebuilding those countries, um, it's about giving people who want to stay nearby the region, who want to go back, an opportunity to do so. And again, that's a, that comes back to funding uh, and investment in those in those camps. Uh, yes, those UN camps that Melissa has been telling us about. Uh, a question from Jira Soktok via Twitter. Why are there no rich Muslim countries opening their doors to their Muslim brothers. A lot of people um, tweeting at the moment on that point as well. Stephen? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's, the, again, this is the right question to ask. I think we need to sort of, there's been so much focus on Europe and the internal divisions within Europe, and it hasn't been enough focus on the global response to this. What, what are other countries doing? What are other major nations mm -hmm. doing? Those in the region, those further afield, those have the means to do this. Um, and I think that's, again, if, we, if Europe can start focusing on the, the real issues, the fundamental issues, it can, it can pay a part in that. Uh, Melissa, what is the UN doing on this point? Is, is the UN trying to appeal to other uh, predominantly Muslim countries to do more? Oh, absolutely. We're appealing to everyone to do more. I mean, obviously not Lebanon that has now 25% of its population refugees. Um, and this, it, 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 Jordan, huge numbers, uh, 2 million in Turkey. Iraq even has a huge population of Syrian refugees, even though people are leaving Iraq uh, at the same time. Um, the Gulf countries have been um, actually the, the Syrian workers who've been um, who've been there for many years. They're extending their their welcome. They're able to continue to stay, and, and they don't have to go back. Their visas are extended. Their benefits are there. Obviously, all countries though need to play a part in offering asylum, in offering resettlement, in providing funding. Uh, the U.S. just increased its level of, of resettlement of Syrian refugees. So did uh, Canada. So did Australia. Um, well, what if sort of everyone funding is came coming together, from... we even have countries like Brazil. What, what sort of funding is coming from, from those uh, Muslim uh, nations in, in the region? Well, you know, when, I, when you say Muslim, from, from the Gulf nations, particularly Kuwait, we've received really significant funding, and we have to say that. Um, from the other Gulf countries, uh, the funding has not come directly to the United Nations. UNHCR coordinates the entire response in the region. They tend to contribute through their own charities, um, and I, don't, I haven't, do not know the sum. They have been helping uh, Syrians, that is for sure. But would it be fair um, to say, do we ask sorry to interrupt, more? Melissa, yes. uh, we would, are, it, would yes. it be fair to say that those countries are focusing more on uh, funding uh, and help for refugees in the region rather than taking people into their countries? Well, you could say that about a lot of countries. Uh, you could say that about the UK. Um, the emphasis is on providing funding and not on taking in large numbers of refugees. What we're asking is that we need, uh, we need a bit of both, or not even both, but several, that we need funding, we need people um, to, to uh, take in asylum seekers, and we need people to, to provide resettlement places from the region. If we have more and more countries, not all, those who are doing it already, increasing their numbers, increasing what they're giving, um, and others who are not taking part, um, beginning to take part, we would go a long way to contributing um, to sharing the burden and to easing also um, all of the, uh, the, the tension in the, on, on Europe. Uh, just seeing a line coming in from uh, Brussels, uh, the European Commission uh, warning that 19 EU member states, including France and Germany, face possible uh, sanctions for failing to implement rules on handling asylum seekers coming to Europe. Uh, so that just highlights uh, the difficulties that various EU nations are having in dealing with this uh, crisis. Uh, and uh, the Hungarian Prime Minister just saying that he thinks this migrant crisis should be dealt with 
within the laws we have, although I think it's fair to say that those laws are being placed under um, severe strain. Uh, one more question from uh, Freedom via Twitter. Um, why don't these people have their papers? Secondly, second part to that, why are there so many men? Stephen, that's a common, uh, apparently fit and well young men uh, amongst the, the migrants, the refugees that we're seeing. Hmm. Uh, well, I guess, there's, I mean, I guess the first thing on papers is often a lot of these people are coming through tra people trafficking and, and smuggling, which they are told to get rid of their papers. Um, but on the, the issue of um, why, why so many young, fit men, um, I think there's probably two reasons. One of which is that while there obviously is a big crisis that's been caused by Syria right now, there have been a historically large numbers of economic migrants from countries like the Balkans, which um, Europe has, been, has really struggled to deal with. So that's a chronic problem that's, that's existed already. I think when it comes to Syria, I guess if you're, if you're, the problem with the current system is it basically incentivizes people to take a long journey often dangerous and probably the youngest fittest men are most likely to do that and I think that that's why the focus should really be on helping those people in the region and we can have a debate about how many people you resettle but it probably should be put, taking people from the region not encouraging them to take a long journey potentially life-threatening journey um, in order to reach Europe. Uh, Melissa I suppose what lies behind questions like this is you know people questioning whether uh, young men like this fit the definition of, of vulnerable, whether indeed they are genuine refugees rather than economic migrants, and, and, and why um, would they leave potentially families behind? Well, um, first of all, uh, many men are fleeing because they don't want to fight, frankly. I've talked to many uh, it's, it went, it, during my you know, trips around Europe now where I interview um, particularly Syrians. And uh, I've, I've talked to young men who are students. Um, ISIS came into their town. Um, another man who just did not want to fight with the government army. Um, th you have that phenomenon right now. Um, people just, they, don't, they just don't want to fight. You also have, um, obviously, as Stephen said, young men coming because they feel that if they could come to Europe, they could survive the journey better than sending their wife uh, or their children. Um, and, you know, if they can do it, then perhaps they could then reunite their family after. You're seeing a lot okay. of young Afghans. Um, these are M young Melissa, students I'm, I'm um, very really, often um, I'm, who are also coming. I, I'm really sorry to have to interrupt you in the middle of your answer, but we are absolutely out of time. Thank you both uh, very much, uh, Melissa Fleming from the UNHCR and Stephen Booth Thanks. from Open Europe. Thank you for your time today. We'll be putting more of your questions on the migrant crisis to a panel of experts at 3.30 here on the BBC News Channel. Uh, you can send your question to 61124 on social media using the hashtag BBC Ask This or with an email to have your say at bbc.co.uk.